right, welcome to our island biogeography lesson. I warn you, there is a cat up here, and she may knock things over. So if you hear loud noises, I'll try and keep the curse words out. So what is island biogeography? It's the study of relationships of organisms that are on islands, how those organisms are distributed, and then the community structures that they form. An island doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of land in the middle of the ocean. It can be any isolated ecosystem. So for example, mountaintops, where you have kind of this community that's developed on top of a mountain, are considered islands in this case. Why? Because they're isolated from the surrounding area. If you're like, oh, why doesn't things, why doesn't, why don't organisms just move down the mountain? Well, they'll encounter different abiotic conditions. They'll have different temperatures, different moistures. And so um, the organisms that are living on these mountaintops are isolated there. Um, and it helps to study these because for a couple of reasons. One, islands are smaller than continents. You can study in a lot more detail. And two, islands tend to be unique environments. And we'll talk about that more. Islands tend to be colonized by species arriving from somewhere else. So if you think about it, if there's like a newly formed island out there, how is our living things going to get to it? Well, here we have just kind of a section where we have, um, we could say this is a continent. Here's a body of water. And here's an island. So let's say we have a population of turtles on the continent. Well, how could they get out to that island? Well, they could swim. And if they swim out there, they could actually start to establish a population of turtles on that island. Similar things happen with plants. So for example, coconuts are really good at floating. And that is because they're, they're kind of designed or adapted to float from one island to another, from mainland to an island. That way the coconuts can spread to large, uh, larger areas and make sure their population stays in existence. So plants spread easily, um, especially if they're like able to float or if they are, uh, their seeds are carried on the wind. Anything that can swim can make it to an island, though obviously if something has less swimming ability, it's going to be a little harder for it to move to an island. Um, birds can fly to islands, so those tend to be the, the ways that organisms make it out there. Really quickly, we're going to get into a little bit of island biogeography theory. Um, it's a theory that was proposed by a couple of famous scientists, including E.O. Wilson, who's huge in uh, ecology and, and biology in general. Uh, and it, they were looking at species diversity, so biodiversity on islands. And they, they came to a couple of conclusions. So there are two major factors determining the number of species that are present on an island. Immigration, which is measured as colonization by a new species that's not been on that island before. So let's say we were looking at the previous example and we had some turtles move in and then we had more turtles of the same species move in. Only this first event would be immigration because that's when you're colonizing that island with a new species that hasn't been there before. Other turtles coming in are just kind of replenishing the, the population that's on the island. So that's different. Um, and then extinction is when that species disappears from the island. Keep in mind, it's a little different from extinction in a general sense. There's extinction on a worldwide level where every member of that species is gone. And then there's this local extinction that we're talking about. Obviously, when you have new species immigrate into an area, you're going to have um, an increase in the species diversity. When you have more species going extinct, that's going to decrease the species diversity. And there's this point at which the rate of species immigration matches the rate of species extinction, and this is called equilibrium because your um, species richness is gonna stay the same. The thing is, you'll still have some species going extinct and some species colonizing. So the 
identity of the species can change, but the number of species will stay the same. So we call this a dynamic equilibrium. It's changing, but the number of species is staying the same. So there's a, a couple of other things that can affect um, the immigration rates and the extinction rates. The area or the size of the island is a, is a big deal. Um, so if you have a large island, it tends to have larger resources, which means it can support more species. Um, so notice that you actually have, um, I believe this is the rate, yes, the rate of extinction um, which is also higher for a small island. The reason is, is that you're gonna have less resources, so there's more competition and um, you're gonna have more likelihood of, of organisms out competing each other and going extinct. Larger islands, on the other hand, have more resources. Another thing for um, the island area effect is that your immigration rate will probably be higher. Uh, sorry, that's supposed to be a curve. Just because a large target is easier to hit. So if you have a large island like Madagascar, that's going to be a lot easier to hit than a tiny island like Galveston. But if you're like, oh, but there are plenty of species on Galveston. I've been there. That is due to the distance effect. So the more isolated you are from larger land masses, the less likely you are to have species immigrate. Also keep in mind, once you have some species immigrate, you've got a small population set up on your island. It helps if you get more organisms from that same species to come and, and live in that island because then you have more genetic diversity. It's more likely you're gonna have a, a nice diverse ecosystem that can support itself or can maintain itself, will develop. So um, the farther you are from a land mass, the, less li the, less, uh, the lower the species diversity you're likely to have. Um, and so things like Galveston is super close to Houston, I'm pretty sh I mean, to the shore of Texas uh, mainland. I'm pretty sure if you were a good swimmer, you could probably make it. I know people have crossed like the English Channel from England to France. Um, however, say getting to Australia from India, much larger distance. And I know Australia is technically a continent, but you can think of it as a continent or a really big island. Um, and so you know, you'll have less species being able to travel that distance. They, they need to survive the, the, the uh, journey over to the island as well. All right, so what's the relevance of this? Well, uh, let's talk real quick before we get into some more detail about generalists versus specialists. For them, it's all about the niche. That's what determines the difference between these two types of species. So a generalist has a broad niche um, and they can survive under a wider range of environmental conditions. They can eat a wider variety of foods. They can exist in a lot of different habitats. And if their environment changes, they can adapt pretty easily. So some examples of generalists are rats, raccoons, roaches, and even humans. That's why humans have spread throughout a large part of the world, um, as well as a lot of these other species. A lot of these species that we tend to think of as pests um, they're pests because they can survive in a lot of conditions. Unfortunately, that also includes our houses where we don't necessarily want them. This is very different from a specialist. A specialist has a very narrow niche. They are specialized to live in a specific environment. So they may have a very limited diet. Like up here on this uh, image, you see a panda. Pandas only eat bamboo. That's it. They don't eat meat, they don't eat other plants, and in fact, during different seasons, they eat different parts of the bamboo. I mean, they're super picky eaters. They are extremely specialized to their habitat. Um, and so you can't take a panda and move it to, say, Mongolia and expect it to survive. You probably put, couldn't take a panda like 100 miles from its current habitat and expect it to survive. I'm sorry, I'm kind of like, pandas, really? You're not making this easy on yourselves. Um, and they do not adapt well to environmental change. A lot of the species that you'll see that have gone extinct in the past 100, 200 years, or that are very highly endangered, a lot of those are specialists because their environments changed, sometimes due to humans, sometimes not, and they can't adapt. Because of that, they go extinct. You adapt or die. 
pretty much. So some examples, uh, pandas we talked about, koalas. Koalas live in certain areas of Australia. They also only eat one type of plant, eucalyptus trees. Uh, tiger salamanders are another example. They need moist environments because they're amphibians. So they have a tadpole stage that lives in water. Um, and they also have certain dietary requirements. Um, so let's look at what happens on an island. Islands are not super huge. There's a limit to the amount of resources that are there. So because of this amount of limited resources, whether it's food or territory or water, um, a lot of island species have become very specialized. So what happens is the, there's limited resources, which increases competition. And then that increased competition um, can lead to niche or resource partitioning, which is remember when uh, we had, a, a, like I had some test questions and had some examples that let's say this is a tree. You might have uh, some species that, let's highlight. Uh, some species that will live in the outer edges of the tree and you might have another species that will live on the inner surface of the tree and they divide up space that way to make sure that they're not competing because if they were all trying to live in the same area eventually one of them would would get out competed and before that Everybody suffers when there's competition. Since you're fighting over something limited, you get less than if there were no other organisms around. So this, um, this leads to resource partitioning or niche partitioning, and they become specialized. So an example of this is the Galapagos Islands, which are off the coast of South America. Um, they're heavily studied. Charles Darwin did a lot of work there. Um, and so what he ended up, what people have ended up figuring out is that a bird species called a finch um, ended up getting blown off course from South America and landing on the Galapagos Islands. Now that common ancestor of those finches um, ended up reproducing and since there are limited resources there the birds started competing against each other so then over time they started specializing. Some birds had um, these kind of sharper pointier beaks and they were better able to get insects. So eventually over time, um, those birds started to form a different species that specialized in eating insects. Others might have like, um, let's see, these guys, the seed eaters, they have kind of shorter beaks. Uh, they can crush seeds. And so they tended to specialize to eat seeds and some of them might even specialize to eat specific seeds like this guy right here he's got a big old beak he probably eats larger seeds that are harder to crush whereas this guy right here with the narrow beak probably eats the smaller seeds and then you see their other adaptations so from this one single species you had a whole ton of species evolve that were each very specialized but you can imagine Let's say that you, um, this guy right here, since we said he probably eats small seeds, let's see those, say those small seeds die out, whatever those plants are. Well, this guy doesn't have a big beak, can't crush large seeds, so there's a higher chance of him going extinct. Whereas his ancestor had this kind of medium-sized beak that could maybe get at some fruit, maybe get at a few insects, maybe get at some seeds. Um, and so it was able to be very generalized and eat a lot of different things. Um, another thing to talk about is let's talk about endemic species and invasive species. Endemic species are not only native to an area, but usually they're only found in that one area in the world. Australia has a ton of endemic species. You don't find kangaroos naturally in South America. Um, islands tend to have a lot of endemic species as well. Why? Because islands will have their own little micro habitats and micro environments. And as species adapt to those, well, they'll change. They'll become different enough from wherever they, they first originated that they're no longer able to interbreed. They're not the same species. Um, and then they're only found in that environment because they're highly adapted to that environment. Um, on the other hand, uh, we, especially humans, tend to bring species into an area, sometimes on purpose. 
will be like, oh, I want to take my cats with me when I move somewhere. Oh, well, we're going to take some dogs with us or horses. And a lot of times it ends up being accidental. Um, we'll talk more about this later on, but there are plenty of invasive species that humans have introduced on purpose. Um, sometimes just because we're like, oh, it looks pretty. And other times we're trying to do something. And that becomes a problem because without the natural population controls that you usually find in an ecosystem, like predators, parasites, uh, things like that, those populations of invasive species often grow out of control really dramatically. Just go up to any Australian person and talk about rabbits and they will probably like want to punch you in the face. If you're like, rabbits are good, because they've had a lot of problems with rabbit populations growing out of control. Uh, Australia has had a ton of invasive species. We haven't done good things there. Um, unfortunately, since um, these, these uh, invasive species, a lot of times they're also generalists, they can outcompete native species, especially those specialists, and cause them to become endangered or even extinct. There are dozens, maybe hundreds of species of birds in the Hawaiian Islands that are either severely endangered, like critically endangered, or extinct because of all things, we uh, accidentally allowed rats to get into the area, they eat eggs, uh, and birds. I, I love my, I mean not birds, and cats. I love my cats, but I know that they are evil little killers. That's why I keep them inside the house. All right, that's it for island biogeography. I will hope to have another couple of sets of notes ready for you the next time I see you.